buckets. How many folks use buckets? Okay. How many folks use tubing? So it's a split operation. All right. Um, okay. So honestly, I don't know how I'm going to talk for 45 or 50 minutes about tubing versus buckets, but we're going to try. Or it could just evolve into a lot of questions and answers of things that you had from this morning. So first off, um, you got a lot of different options out there and we've covered quite a few of those already in the morning in the intro session um, with again food safety almost always taking front and center now um, with the lead scare you know anything pre 1980 81 is probably got lead solder in it all right and uh, not everything that you think is food grade is food grade not all plastic is food grade um, and so you really want to be careful what you get out there. Yeah, just because it's cheap and online doesn't mean you should use it. Um, again, buckets freeze and they break. How many folks have ever broken a bucket yet? All right. That's one, you know, you don't think it's going to get as cold at night as it does and it freezes or freezes solid, uh, and, and breaks the bucket. That's never a, a good sign. Things freeze and then it takes a while for it to thaw out. Again, loss of production while things are freezing and thawing. And, and, uh, but this is kind of common, what, what I like to see folks start out as. You know, a five gallon pail, that is a food safe pail with some drops. We have learned though that uh, we were making our drops fairly long, okay? So we had more flexibility. And you'd just, you'd shove it in that hole um, of your bucket, set it on the ground, and then come back the next day after it's gone through a freezing and thawing cycle, and you figure that bucket's gonna be three quarters full. Get back there, and it's hardly any sap had run. And you're scratching your head, because it was 35 degrees or 40 degrees. Well, what we were learning is, as we put those drops in the bucket and they went to the bottom of the bucket, what do you think the tree did at night? Sucked her all back up. So Steve Childs out of Cornell wanted to know what the internal vacuum of a tree was. What is its potential to pull back sap? Why is it emptying a bucket? The tree is just pulling what it gave you because it could. It pulled back about 22 feet worth of sap in a tubing system naturally. That's how impressive that vacuum is in a tree. Again, you saw this earlier, and it's, it's repetition, but if you hang a bucket, you have to gather it. You know, this is where the, the kind of the gloss comes off of the, the mystique of making maple syrup is there's a lot of labor involved. Great if you have a lot of neighbors and friends and family, um, but you know, my uncles, when they were gathering, had 4,000 buckets. I know of producers up in, in Michigan that are tapping 10 to 12,000 buckets, right? They now, unfortunately, over the last 10 to 12 years that I've been in and around there, actually, I should say 15, because that's how long I've been married. I don't want to make that mistake. It's been 15. Um, they can't find kids in the high schools that want to gather sap. And so now they're faced with, I either have to modernize or go out of business because they can't find labor. And so anytime you look at when you go to expand, you have to ask yourself, in 10 or 15 years, am I gonna physically be able to gather sap or can I find the labor to do it? You know, and one of the big things, I was getting older, getting ready to head off to college and we were putting in new systems we got rid of all of our buckets. We have one or two around the sugar house to show folks. Everything else, it is a turnkey system for my dad who is 74 years old. He's the young guy on the crew, all right? We have an 85 year old who does all of our hauling, which is terrifying because he moves a thousand gallons of sap at a time over the road. And we've got like an, a low 80, upper 70, guy that does all of our firing so he's the boiler so um, <clears throat> we had to make it as 
labor unintensive as possible. We also tried to get away from this. There's a lot more information coming out, and I spoke to it this morning, about the damage caused by those ruts. So I didn't ask the question this morning. On a, let's say it's an 80 foot tall maple tree. How far does, it root, how far does its root system go out from the base of that tree? How far out this way? Big as the canopy, 20 feet. You're all wrong. Common misperception. One and a half to two times the height. It's out 160 to 200 feet. How deep do you think those roots are? 10 to 12 inches. 85 to 90% of all roots are right here. All right? So, you know, some trees have tap roots. But that's not the majority of, of those fine roots. So now we know we're doing a tremendous amount of compaction and actually that severs the roots. So what happens below ground directly reflects how much sap you get in two different ways. First off, the tree can't give you sap if it can't access water and the fine roots access water. It also can't give you sap and sugar if it kills its top back. Because the first thing a tree does is it cuts back above ground as a direct reflection of what's below ground. So if you cut off 40% of the roots, over time it's going to shrink its canopy. Well, what happens when you shrink a canopy? Or it makes smaller leaves up there and you don't even know it. It's going to produce less sugar. It's going to give up less sugar. It's going to hurt the tree long term. All right. So we can have a direct impact of it doesn't give us water because it, it, can't, it can't get water. So you really have to be careful where and how you run your collection. Run high flotation tires. Run tracks if you can. Carry more of the sap rather than run closer to every tree. All right, let's talk about tubing. All right, as we begin, there's been a, a tremendous change in tubing technology and in extraction. And whether you're tapping 20 trees or whether you're tapping 20,000, tubing is a very good option for a labor reduction and for sanitation, all right? So pretty much everything in the industry has been 5 16 inch tubing. All right, this, uh, this drop line or this section that I'm going to pass around, that is semi-rigid plastic. It is now, we've gotten much better at making it shelf or, or light UV stabilized. All right, in the past, their UV stabilization wasn't good. And about three or four years in, you could take a hold of it and while you're stretching it, it would just crack. All right, but now we, we're seeing producers get that chemistry dialed in, it's food grade, potable, uh, and you're looking at $38 a roll for that tubing. It's got a 10 year lifespan. It's gonna, that roll is gonna give you 500 feet. All right, so incredibly cheap. I remember as a kid, we used to, we used to run 15 to 20 taps per lateral line out in this spider web. We'd run them around trees, you know, we'd arc back and forth. More trees, the better, because more sap. We had a vacuum on it, so who cared? You know, we were sucking them down. Well, the research came out of Quebec and it came out of Vermont. We were dead wrong. The more taps you add beyond about seven, the lower the yield is. You physically cannot move that sap out of the line fast enough when you're starting to have 15 to 20, 25 taps on it. So now our recommendation is three to seven, and I'll be honest, all of our sugar bushes, if I don't, I don't go past five. I have three to five taps. That's taps, not trees. Three to five taps per lateral line. So I've got a lot more main line out in the woods, all right? Mainline carries sap and vacuum. 
The laterals just get it right there to it, okay? I don't ever go more than 100 feet, and I'm probably going to change this slide. I'm probably going to back that down to 80 feet. If I can't get from one end of, of my vacuum main line to my last tree on that lateral in under 70 to 80 feet, I'm going to look at why my layout is not right on my, on my main line. A few years ago, this new kid, anybody run 3 sixteenths? This new kid came on the block. It's 3 sixteenths. It, it was tested in Vermont. It was tested in Quebec on these ultra steep slopes. So the thinking is the more trees we have, the more volume we have. The steeper the slope, the faster that sap will move down. And, and by making it 3 sixteenths, the adhesive cohesive action of the sap will pull itself down the hill, all right? And so by the bottom of the hill, if you're putting this long snaking line directly uphill and having 50, 80, 100 feet of fall, you actually pull vacuum at the very top of it to the tune of getting 18, 19, 20, 22 inches of mercury, which is vacuum, at the very top. And it grades down as you go. All right, but that was in areas where either A, they couldn't run a vacuum pump because there wasn't a good option to get power there, or they didn't want to invest in a vacuum pump or a release or something like that. Quickly, what they learned is first year, your production is through the roof. You're gonna make more than you would on a gravity system and a 5 16 hands down. You're gonna make a lot of sap. Second year, well, you're about on par with, with somebody that, that is doing 5 sixteenths and a gravity system. By the third year, you will scratch your head and wonder, why am I not getting any sap? All right. So what has happened is the biofilm in that 3 sixteenths clogs the T's. So every point in a line that goes tree to tree to tree, you have to somehow get this guy attached to it. And this is a drop line. So you've got your tap up here, and this is your T. And the 3 16 T's were clogging. So I'll pass that around. This is a 5 16 I just wanted you to see the, the T's out there. So now we know we either have to put vacuum on these 3 16 or, and, or, we have to suck down through a sanitizer and then push back with clean water in hopes that we can blow, blow the bacterial crud and slime out the tap, all right? If not, you're looking at the fourth year replacing the whole system, which should have had a 10-year shelf life, all right? Huge expense, which we're just now learning about. I know a lot of these systems went in, and a lot of these systems are coming out. Now, when you look at that T in that spout, just hold it up. You can actually, at the end of the season, when you pull it out of the tree, see the little on the, on the T, there's that one side that doesn't have any barb fittings. Not that one, not that one, the top one, yeah. Put the two together. So at the end of the season, when you pull your tap out, you've got to do that, all right? Why? Keeps the air out. Yeah, no. Dirt. There's a specific dirt I'm looking for. Not bacteria. Niters formed in the boiling. Mud dauber wasps. That was my job one season. We thought, let's air dry our tubing. So we, we pulled the vacuum. We pulled all the junk out of it. Let them air dry. That'll kill any bacteria in there. That'll, you know, it'll desiccate. So we left them open. Uh-uh. 2,500 times I had to pull a one single mud dauber larvae out of those things. They are efficient at filling the ends of taps. So don't ever leave them open. It's okay to leave them open early on in the season when you're draining them out, but then you got to walk it, all right? So tubing is more efficient 
in the fact that you get that sap brought right to you. It's less efficient because we walk our tubing at least once a week and we have 35 miles of it, all right? So we walk it once a week for leaks because the squirrels chew on it, the deer run through it, the bears just do what bears do, um, branches fall on it. It is constant maintenance, all right? Buckets are great, but there's a lot of gathering daily of, of, for that labor. So tubing is still the way to go, but it's not a put it up and walk away from it. It's not a, you know, so we walk it to prep it, make sure it's tight, make sure it's running downhill because everything's on grade. We walk it when we tap it, and then we walk it once a week to check for leaks or more often than that. Then we have to walk it to sanitize it, air dry it, plug it back up. So we're probably out there walking those lines 10 or 12 times through the season, beginning to end, if not more. You can't walk it enough. All right. So they used to be 7 16ths. We've already covered that. You can use 7 16ths or, or 5 16ths. Um, they're really, it's, I would prefer just to use the 5 16ths in vacuum. Um, this one, anybody ever use a check spout? So you know how we talked about the tree's ability to backflow and pull back in on itself? This check spout was developed so that it can stop the tree. It pulls that little ball back in on a, on a basically a little valve area and stops the vacuum coming back. Does two things, it gets you a lot more sap and it keeps the tree's tap hole cleaner because you're not backflowing sap that is bacterial laden. So it is a little bit slower because what shuts a tree down in, in primarily right around that tap hole, it's the presence of bacteria clogging those cut wood vessels. Um, and so this check spout is expensive. They say it's a one and done. We're sugar makers. We clean them, sterilize them, use them over, all right? Drops, we started off, so that drop line that's passing around, you know, I remember as a kid, we would make drop lines 16 inches long because we were cheap. We wanted that roll of tubing to go a long way. The problem is when you're standing by a tree, that 16 inch drop line can't really go very far and it definitely can't go around to the other side. So now we're seeing an industry standard come in at 30 inches, if not 36 or 40. We're also seeing a lot of work come out of Cornell and Vermont where they're replacing those drops every couple years, if not every year from the sanitation aspect it looks like there is a lot of bacteria load in that drop that doesn't get cleaned, all right? And so they're finding that just from bacteria load, so the age of your system, year zero, there's virtually no bacteria load because that has never happened or it has never grown because it never supported sap. By about year four, there's quite a bit of bacteria in there. And so your production can naturally go down because you're automatically seeding the tap hole with a bacteria laden spout, all right? So by year eight, nine, 10, I mean, it is just like a Petri dish's dream, really. So we've worked a lot about how do we sanitize our taps? How do we sanitize our teas? How do we sanitize our main lines? And there's a lot of um, good things and bad things. Being that we are in America, not in Canada, there are certain rules we have to follow that they don't up north. So up north, they're allowed, they are um, past their kind of their ag and markets and their food safety folks, they can use isopropyl alcohol. So they flood their lines with isopropyl alcohol. We can't do that here. We shouldn't do that here, all right? So if you are doing that here and you get caught because the inspectors now are making a big push at looking for that, if they go out in the middle of winter and they can go like this in your tubing system and it sloshes, it's not frozen, it's probably gonna get cut open and tested. If they find isopropyl alcohol in your sugar house or in your lines, they will take all of your syrup. 
They will dump all of your syrup. It is unapproved sanitation, all right? A lot of syrup comes in here that's made with isopropyl alcohol, sanitized lines. The buyers now in America are saying they can taste it in the syrup and they are rejecting syrup that they think is made with lines that are isopropyl alcohol. Don't get in the habit of using it. We're working on a couple of different sanitizers like that beer sanitizer. That has about a two minute sanitation time frame. It takes about two minutes of those foam bubbles to completely sanitize your lines. That's not really good enough because that sap uh, and sanitizer gets sucked down at the end of the season. All right, we need something that actually kills faster. All right. So we're looking at a new product that has about a 20 second residence time. Something that we can pump from the bottom up and get the, the residence time in our tubing to sanitize it. All right. So again, we talked earlier about focusing on the south side of the tree that's gone. That's the old habit. Now we go all the way around the tree. So this is one of our new systems that we're putting in. This is a little demo unit. Uh, it's 300 taps at the station. Next year, we add another 3,000 with two different styles of, of tubing. If you want, if you have never installed a tubing system and you're frightened of how do I even start the process, we are going to host over at the station. So it's going to be a little hike for you because it's three hours from here. We are going to host a series of design and layout. So if you want to learn how we install two different types of systems, we will you know, spend a, a couple of days, especially on weekends, but we will spend a couple of days installing main lines. We'll then come back and spend a couple of days installing lateral lines. We'll talk to you about how we run vacuum. And so I would encourage you to keep track and, and we'll send it through Darren and his crew but you can also keep track of our website and we'll put out there well in advance when we're going to do it. We're not going to do it when there's three feet of snow on the ground. All right. Nobody likes to do that. So we probably will be working in there all summer and we will have systems for you to look at. What you're seeing is the blue main line. All right. Everything, as long as you remember straight, tight, downhill. STD, all right? STD in maple, straight, tight, downhill. Your lateral lines, your main lines, they cannot sag. What happens in a sag? Water collects. Your sap collects in there. Guess what freezes? Water. Water. Guess what happens the next day when the tree starts to run? Blockage. Blockage. I didn't plant him, by the way. I have no idea. He's good, though. All right. So where do you start in this system? You start at the lowest point in the woods that you're going to collect from. That's your tank. The top of your tank is the starting height of your main line. Everything from that point going forward has to be uphill. All right? So does anybody... Is there a stonemason in here? Darn, they make good. You need to know who your stonemason is in town and then hire them for a day because they know how to run things on grade. And if you really want to cheat, you go to the store and you buy a line level. All right, this is your handy dandy line level. And there is a zero bubble on there. If the bubble touches the line, you're at about a quarter inch of fall, which is where we roughly want to be as a minimum for our slope. All right. Anything less than that, your sap is going to have a harder time moving and you're going to have to help it. Anything more than that, you better be in like Vermont country and have really good slope. Is, is there ever too much slope to have in a main line? Anybody run into this problem? That comes into, and we'll talk about it quickly here soon, when you improperly size your main line, 
and you put too many taps on it and you get this big slug of liquid in a main line and it's too small and you tip it like this. Sap doesn't flow like normal water down that grade. Sap starts to cavitate and it starts to roll on top of each other. Guess what happens if you have a vacuum pump hooked to that? Vacuum can't go back to the trees, all right? So your main line, you don't really care about vacuum in your main line. You care about how well your vacuum is getting to your tree and that's the measure of it. So we'll look at some slopes here in a minute, but you can see that the main lines, they fall into each other. So we always enter a, one main line going into the top of the other. Why do we do that? So it doesn't build up where the connection is. So build up where the connection is and there's always going to be liquid on the bottom of that tubing when the sap is running. The vacuum is going to sit at the very top of that chamber. All right, so what we want to do is we want to transfer as much, see, we want to transfer as much vacuum from this main line going down to the tank into this line as possible. All right, this is what happens when you tap on the south side of the tree. All right, how many tap holes do you count in that tree? There's 22, all right, all on the south side. And now look at this tree, it's wound response. See that, all right? Remember, when you drill a hole in the tree, it's always gonna be there, all right? So now think there's like 22 taps all on the south side of the tree, all in two, three inches. How much of that tree is actually functioning on this side? What do you think the top of the crown looks like? That side of the tree is hurting. There's also not a lot of wood holding that side of the tree up, okay? So don't do this. So what happened right here? It's a tapping crack, all right? So that's what happened when you drive your spile a little bit too hard and you go tink, 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 tunk, tunk, crack, okay? it caused a vertical crack now that the tree has had to seal over, right? Again, it's longer to seal, longer for that tree to recover. Here's our main lines. Okay, these are the guidelines that we have forth. <coughs> when we first started as a little kid, we would use half inch main lines. What did we learn? We can't carry enough vacuum back. So we went to three quarter. I can tell you, I'm actually gonna go and put a line through this one. The difference in cost between three quarter and one inch pipe is virtually nothing, okay? Go to the one inch pipe. You always go one step bigger than you think you need. So to read this, we have percent slope. So less than 5% slope, so flatlanders. Five to 10% slope, greater than 10% slope, okay? And these are the number of taps that correspond to this size main line. So if I'm on a flat land, I'm going to put less than 700 taps on a one inch main line. 400 to 900 on that same one inch on a five to 10% slope. All right. It can just move sap fast enough. Now over 10%, we're looking at 600 to 1100. When you start getting up around that 1,000 to 1,100, you're going to begin to have that sap cavitate in that main line on those really heavy run days, all right? What, what should a tree give us on a, on a heavy run day? Gallon. Gallon. Yeah. So normally I say we need storage capacity on an average run of two gallons per tap hole. On those exceptional days that happen maybe once or twice a season, you're going to need three gallons of capacity. All right? That's how we look at it now with these modern figures. So there's that main line. The lowest point is right where I'm at. It's all on grade. All right? We use high tensile wire. So 12 and a half gauge smooth high tensile wire. 
when we are done stretching the wire, you want to be able to play a song on it, all right? And my guys did not do well, okay? So we have these pullbacks, and those pullbacks are there to support it so it doesn't sag at all. And it also tightens that wire a little bit. But most of the time, you're putting all of the tension with a ratchet come along, all right? And I'll show you one of those in a minute. So what they did is, having never made syrup, I sent them out there. And we are a learning institution, so we let them make mistakes, and I can't really yell at them. Um, but they went out there. They thought they did what I told them. But they used the tie backs to pull more of the tension out of it, all right? So what happens, and why I would rather this line go straight, every curve you have slows my sap down, all right? So I don't want to see a big Z zigzag pattern in there. I'd rather see a straight shot supported with T-posts every 10 feet than all of the drawbacks, all right? And so it is what it is, we'll live with it. Um, but again, no sags. I'd rather you drive a post in to keep it up. What was the size of that wire you used? 12 and a half gauge, smooth, high tensile wire. Basically field fence, you know, uh, high tensile wire. So in woods with really good slope, where you know where your tank is going to be set, we use these eye hooks, all right? And we weld them closed because we're putting so much tension on them, we can actually open them up. That's how tight we're making this whole system. Now, the problem with this is in 10 years, that tree is going to have grown out half an inch to an inch. So I buy longer lags, eye bolts, and I don't put them in all that way. And then when I need to, 10 years, 15, 20, I'm normally gonna be in replacing my main lines as well, I back them out, all right? So that's that ratchet come along, all right? Has anybody ever used those? Has any of you ever caught your finger in those? Just be careful, they work great, but they also tear you up good. We also routinely, when you're doing forest management, you routinely have to get into your sugar bush. You have to take some trees out, trees fall on your lines. Well, if we did this as one solid unit, you could never take it down and lay it on the ground. So we started putting carabiners in where we could back them off, or, or they, they're not carabiners, they're more like those uh, chain links that you can strap on right here. We take those down once you let the tension off. You can lay your main line down, do the work, bring it back up. So here's another system. This one happened to be in Iowa. We came in and the guy was having trouble uh, with it. And so the one main line was going up the valley, which is what we want him to do. He just zip tied this other one on, big loop. Couldn't figure out why. He was freezing too much. And down in those draws, where the sun doesn't get to it and doesn't warm it up, that's a problem. So what we did is we told them to come in and we start putting more ties. And so when you're installing mainline, you're gonna get really good at using these two. Any concrete, concrete guys here? We got one. All right, these are basically concrete wire ties and I affectionately term this the nose picker. Okay, you get really good at running nose pickers, all right? So every foot, I am lashing that main line to the wire with a nose picker. Now, you gotta be real careful when you're putting your main line. My main line always runs under the wire. It hangs on that wire, and you'll see why in a minute. But I'm gonna pass that around. Don't have nightmares. You're kidding. Did they short me? Is it? Wow. All right. Well, I have captive audience for a few more minutes. All right. There's the sags that we deal with. All right. So there's another system, and, and when you get out there and start looking around, this one's called a wet-dry system, and this is ours in upstate New York. All right. What we want to do is we run 2,800 feet underground, then we run another 3,000 feet up the main run, up our main valley. And so that's a long way to take vacuum back to the woods. 
And so this is where our sap line runs. Our sap is in here. This is the wet line. The dry line is where our vacuum runs. And so every lateral main line that we have has equal vacuum. All right. And so it's a way to distribute our vacuum. Just to show you, there are T's, there are Y's, all right? It all depends. We use a lot of the Y's in, in some of the steeper slope operations. We use T's where it's more of a flat ground. Plus the T's are cheaper. All right, <clears throat> there's these ways to attach lateral lines to main lines. This is a saddle fitting and I have some up here. That saddle goes right on the top of your main line drill a hole down in it, put the saddle with a neoprene fitting on it, and it delivers sap right to the top of that main line. This one's a new one, all right? This is a spin fitting. You literally spin the fitting at high speeds and you melt the two forms of plastic together, all right? And then you drill out the center hole. Good and bad with those. That just shows a cross section of what you're doing. You're actually welding, plastic welding, that fitting on. We have sap releasers, sap extractors. Sap extractors have a high pressure pump in the bottom of it, all right? This guy. It can pump against the vacuum up and out. A releaser has the vacuum here and it shuts itself off or it, it shunts the vacuum to another side and dumps the sap out of here into a tank. So two different methods of what you can do. There's also monitoring systems now. They have monitoring, monitoring systems on all the main lines. And so you, from your smartphone, you can tell if you lose vacuum in a line, which means something broke that line. It's an incredible efficiency now of where technology is going. We hear some producers that have adopted all of the technology and all the vacuum. They're not getting a third of a gallon per tap hole, they're getting half a gallon. We have some that get 0.6 gallons per tap hole. All right, so the investment in technology has paid off. All right, I, we're gonna quit there, but when I get back to the office, I will continue the talk and then I'll put it online for you guys because we'll go through all of the different vacuums that we have and what we like and what we don't like. So we'll go through all that. Eh, I just wanted to show you we built that little vacuum pump for about $200. And that'll be good for about 500 taps. All right? So you don't have to buy expensive things when you're handy. And we're all handy. Or we know somebody that's handy. All right. And if you wanted a materials list for that, I can, add, I can send you that as well. Because they're really simple to make. All right.